Welcome back to the D-Web Decoded podcast. My name is Aaron Stanley, and I'll be your host for today's episode with Filecoin Foundation creative lead, Gary Moran. Gary has created a way to host dynamic content websites on IPFS using no-code tools. This offers all the benefits of decentralization with a clean and easy user experience that is accessible to non-coders. All right, so we're here today with Gary Moran, who's the creative lead at Filecoin Foundation. Great to have you on the show, Gary. Hey, nice to chat, Aaron. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, doing all right. Um, yeah, so we're going to be chatting today about decentralized website hosting. So uh, one of our favorite topics in Filecoin land, uh, very cool use case for Web3. And uh, Gary here has found like some really clever ways of you know, I guess we call it, you know, kind of dog fooding our own technology in a sense, but basically finding some clever ways to actually use uh, the Filecoin IPFS tech stack uh, to, in a way to, to, to host websites in a decentralized manner that offers kind of, you know, the utility of like a kind of a Web2 style website hosting solution. So we're going to be diving into that today. So super interesting. Um, but to get started, Gary, why don't you just give us a bit of a, you know, introduce yourself. Uh, what do you do at Filecoin Foundation? What's, what are you all about? Sure. Uh, so I'm one of those um, fun kind of non-technical people at the foundation who uh, I guess the technical people spend a lot of time explaining things slowly to. Um, but as creative lead, my job is, you know, I'm, I'm a designer by training. So my job is often to try to understand these very complex things that no one has quite found a good way to explain yet and hopefully find a way to communicate that and explain it in a way that makes sense to people. Um, and obviously, as a designer, a lot of my process, like the, the process of design is problem solving. So when we have a requirement like, you know, we want to build a website, we don't have any coders, and it needs to run on Filecoin, that's kind of a novel problem to, to deal with, you know. So um, I spend a lot of time like pushing buttons and seeing what works and what doesn't, and something worked. So I guess we need to talk about that. Amazing. And maybe just kind of, you know, just big picture here. Uh, why is it important that any website that you know the Filecoin Foundation developed has to run on you know Filecoin or IPFS? Like, what was what sort of the impetus for that? Well, obviously, you know, first of all, we believe in in the technology that we're working on and the network that we're a part of, and we want to get as much use of it as possible. Not only just like you say for dog fooding and to understand it ourselves, but because of the inherent benefits of that, right? So. We spend a lot of time thinking about like centralized points of failure. You know, if I'm the only one with the password to something and I get hit by a bus, then that thing's gone, right? Whereas, um, you know, a lot of websites nowadays are hosted on AWS, Google Cloud, or um, Microsoft Azure, really. And, and that's like the vast majority of everything that's online. And those are three centralized points of failure. So with our websites, we're actually using platforms that are built on Filecoin to ensure that they're resiliently hosted, that if they go down somewhere, they don't go down everywhere and that, that you know, they can quickly be brought back online again. Um, and actually just before this recording, uh, I had an internet problem and I was trying to load google.com and it wouldn't load. And I just thought like, oh, maybe it's Google. Like I'll load fill.org, our website and yeah. see if that's yeah. because that's a good test, right? To see whether it's like, I didn't know if it was my internet connection or Google servers has gone down. 99% of the time, it's going to be my connection. But with Phil.org, at least I know that, you know, there is that kind of redundancy there. And I'm assuming most listeners would at least know, at least know what IPFS is, have a general idea of like how it works. But maybe just kind of give a little bit of color around uh, like IPFS as a website hosting solution. Like what, what, like what practical benefits does this, does this give you? So, um, Again, in my non-technical understanding of IPFS, essentially it works a lot like a kind of um, mix between GitHub and BitTorrent, right? So it allows people to move files from like multiple peers um, without having to rely on like one central server having the, the data. And it also, obviously, one of the main features of IPFS is content addressing. So I, I like the library analogy we often use for that, that, you know, if I tell you like, go to the New York public library, go up to the third floor, look for the four, fifth bookshelf from the left and look for the 17th book on the third shelf. Like that's a crazy way for me to tell you how to find information, but that's obviously how a lot of the internet works. We give you an address and we tell you to go check it out. But if I tell you, look for a copy of Winning the Willows, you know, you can go to any library and find it there. And that's kind of my understanding of the, the strength of content addressing. 
And then in terms of practicality, what you mentioned where you're not, your, your site is not just wholly dependent on, you know, an AW, if AWS goes down or if they, you know, if they decide they don't like you and they just decide we're going to delete your web, you're, we're just going to delete you, whatever uh, you with hosting on IPFS provides a uh, kind of a hedge against that. Essentially, like you're, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have uptime. You're going to be, you have this uh, degree of, of permanency that you might otherwise have. You're not, you don't have this level of dependency on one centralized, uh, you know, more expensive uh, hoster, website hosting service, essentially. Um, and then maybe talk a bit about just, you know, from a philosophical perspective here, I guess at Filecoin, we, you know, we're, we are trying to sort of use the technology that we are developing. And, and I do think I do, have, one of the ironies of Web3 is like a lot of Web3 is actually just like hosted on AWS at the end of the day. <laughs> it's like one of these sort of like, open secrets that like you're not like supposed to talk about you know when you at these you know decentralization conferences or permissionless conferences or whatever but it's like a lot of this stuff is actually just hosted and if you know i think uh there, there was somebody some i think it was like you know like um jeff garzik i think had made this one clever remark one time where he's like basically if you just dropped like a nuclear bomb over like ashburn virginia where most of the aws servers are housed like you could basically take out, you know, the Ethereum network essentially, <laughs> because most of these nodes are like, are like run on, you know, AWS uh, servers. Essentially. So anyway, I mean, we don't have to go super deep into that, but like, it is one of these kind of ironies that a lot of this web three infrastructure is actually just hosted on web two. So we are obviously trying to take a bit of a, you know, you put your money where your mouth is type of approach. So we'd love your kind of your thoughts on, on why this excites you and, and why we pursued this. I don't know if you if you know um, or if any of the listeners know uh, the Wallace and Gromit animations that come from my city in the UK, Bristol, where I, I lived. But there's this great GIF online from one of their films where there's a dog on the front of a model train and he's like laying the train track as the train moves, you know, and trying not, like in a kind of wily e. coyote way, like trying not to to run out of track. And I sometimes feel that that's that's where we are in Web three. Like everyone is so excited by these new tool, new tools and. We don't want you know to just put things on an AWS server, but sometimes things don't work yet, or they're still being built, or you know they're not quite ready. They, you know maybe they don't have the, the decades of tooling that's been built on top of these Web two platforms. Um, so that can sometimes be a challenge for for us, you know. And, and one of my favorite things about working at the Farcoin Foundation is that we do really try to practice what we preach as much as possible. Um, way more than you know your kind of average Ethereum dog token that's that's floating around. Um, so I think treating that as a like creative limitation rather than a oh well we can't build this because we normally do it this way but it doesn't we don't have that feature yet. Instead being like okay here are the tools that we have how can we put them together to make something that that works well and gives us the result that we need. Yeah, and I think what what you've done with this this website is a great example of that. So we'll, we'll dive into a bit of that. Um, Maybe just get started. You know, you kind of inherited. You're not like a website guy by trade, I guess. You're, you're you're a designer, but like you know, just because we're a you know kind of like a small organization and everybody has to wear multiple hats, like you sort of just inherited the website when you joined, um, and it, you know, maybe it wasn't exactly as you would, how you would have have liked it. So maybe talk a bit about like what was the state of our website? Wait, because basically when you found it, what were the problems you're facing, and and what were the some of the solutions you need you needed to find? So uh, both of our uh, websites that we manage at the foundation, so fill.org and ff.web.org, uh, they were built by an external partner that we worked with who did an amazing job. They're very, like, they look very good from a design perspective. They work very well. Um, that was never really the issue that we had. The issue that we had was that these things were custom coded websites and we didn't have any coders. So, you know, there was a CMS built in, which is a, a content management system, something that allows people like me who aren't coders to go in and like update content, make changes to photos or text, for example. Um, but the CMS that we were using was not particularly user friendly. So again, in this kind of like hit by a bus analogy, right? If I was hit by a bus, there was no one who could, who could make updates <laughs> to the website for a little while. And that was obviously a huge centralized point of failure, which we wanted to address. Um, so aside from urgently teaching other people to use that system and that CMS that we had, we really wanted a more sustainable solution that was going to allow us one to kind of open up access and give people control of their own content. So, you know, we have a lot of different teams within the foundation, even for a small org, um, who I think some of these people are like the most passionate 
and, and most expert people in their kind of niche and giving them the tools to just be able to like make the updates and, and talk the way they need to talk without needing to go through anyone else and, you know, wait for someone on the other side of the world to wake up, I think was a really powerful thing. Um, but also, you know, being that this looking after these websites fell under the purview of design, we really needed to use tools that were more kind of designer friendly. Um, so one of the tools that we'll talk about later is Webflow, which is a, a kind of obviously we editor. It's something that, you know, is not built for a coder to use. Really, it's built for a designer to use in order to make something that has working code. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, a so, few different steps. <laughs> Yeah, so 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 the so you inherited the website. And the, the original website was actually hosted on IPFS as well, correct? So it would have been custom coded to to be to host it on IPFS. So we're 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 kind of checking like the decentralization box, and and we're using our own tech. Yay, that's that's good. That's good. Problem with that was that if you're not a coder, it's like basically impossible to update this thing, <laughs> right? If you're not so exactly. be, because yeah, as we know, like web some of these web three tools are not exactly um, really ready for use by like just average everyday people right so and that's just sort of you know not necessarily criticism but just kind of the reality of where we at, are at right some of these things just are not you know if you're not like a hardcore coder you're not gonna really understand how to use these things right you're not gonna have the skill set to be able to use these things we should say so so what you set out to do is like how can we create you know a, a a website here how can we redo the website in a way that incorporates all these values of decentralization that we're that we're hosting on ipfs and how can we do that in a way where like we can have like the random you know intern on the marketing team be able to post a blog without involving like three different intermediaries to you know <laughs> to, to, to try to you know try to arrange all this and like adjust the code or whatever um, and, and even bigger than that as well you know if we just something simple like we want a new page or we want to like add a new type of content to a page like that's something that we would have had to go to a developer and find a developer who wasn't someone we had on staff at the time uh, to make that change yeah. for us yeah. So, so in the, in, 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 when we're talking about just usability, um, obviously, okay, great. We have this great web three solution, yada, yada. It, it's, you know, it's checking all the centralization boxes, but it's basically unusable for an average person. So this, we haven't really like improved the state of the world like that much. Right. But what, so you set it to do is really find a way to do this in a way that is, um, basically open and accessible to everybody. So, and you did find, find a pretty clever solution here, which we're going to get into. So maybe you kind of walk us through, the journey of like there's kind of like an onion that you maybe maybe we'll, we'll call this like the reverse onion like we'll put the layers back on the onion but like because you went through kind of multiple iterations and different tools and different learnings to, to figure out how to do this but maybe it'd be helpful just to kind of talk through um you know what was like the original sort of well we already kind of talked about the original workflow is basically like okay if i'm if i'm a marketing intern i want to put a blog post i have to basically contact these other people and they're going to make all the changes but maybe talk i'm talking a bit about through this how this new tech stack that you're able to create and then what are the tools that you used what does that process look like um and how are these you know how does this process like sort of work for like everyday people essentially sure so we had a starting point and an end point right the end point was that we wanted it to be hosted on a platform called fleek which is a platform that uses both ipfs and filecoin as well as other web3 tools to host websites resiliently and make sure that you know they're always up and that they're reachable via IPFS. So the end goal was always to get the website there. And that's actually, that is where our original website lived. Uh, the thing is that because of the way IPFS works with content addressing as well, and, and because of some of the ways that Fleek is built, it wasn't as simple as just kind of like, you know, we click install, you know, WordPress, for example, and then it's, it's up and running. Um, Fleek actually, manages or, or the sites that we have on fleek are actually all static sites meaning that there isn't a separate database of content somewhere else the content is encoded directly into the site and there's a lot of benefits to that it's like it's more secure it loads more quickly and um, you know there's a lot of other reasons you might want to have a static site but also you know it keeps the platform simple and means that uh, we could create something that that we could get up and working reliably um, but if you're going to be making lots of changes or adding new new content or adding new pages, then that becomes very problematic, essentially, because it's not really it's set up as a static site, not necessarily like, hey, press this so button and you add, add a new page. Exactly the issue, right? So, so I'll, I'll kind of work backwards from Fleek and, and look at like the the three or four tools that we have 
uh, that helped us get there. So once we have, we, we want to put a static site on Fleek. The way that Fleek works is it basically takes code from GitHub and will build and then publish the site based on that code. So we knew we had to connect Fleek to a GitHub repository. Um, the next step was how do we get a no code website, something that we've built on a platform rather than custom coded onto GitHub. So the platform we use for that is one called Webflow. Webflow is something that's very, very big in, in the design world because it's a very accessible kind of website builder and editor um, that allows you to go in as a designer and like move things around and, you know, not necessarily just click and drag, but like interact with something that's, that's visible. Um, and it does support things like um, database content. So things like blogs and stuff run through databases. So the next trick was like, okay, well, how do we take this site, take the code out, bring the content from those databases with it and get it onto GitHub as static content. So uh, we, were, we tried a few different things and in the end we were lucky enough to find a tool called Udisly. Udisly is a custom built tool that is, is built for exactly this purpose, uh, to take sites from Webflow, run through the code and turn it into something called a Jamstack static site, which basically means, as far as I understand it, pull out all of the stuff that's not necessary, hone down the code to be as kind of agile as possible and to put all of those kind of database entries for blog posts and things like that into markdown files. So basically now all we're doing is like taking each of the pieces that make up that website, putting them on GitHub. And then because all of these pieces exist in one place and they don't have to pull them from anywhere else, Fleek can go through all of those and assemble them and turn them into something that's a, a finished product. So that got us most of the way, but there was, there was one other important factor, which was like, how do we allow other people to, to access and edit these things? Um, so one of the great features of this tool, Usely, is that it builds in a product that's now called Decap CMS into the static site. So this is a Git-based CMS, which basically means uh, anyone can load it up from our team, make changes, and when they click save, that those changes become a, a PR in GitHub. And when they click publish, that PR gets merged in GitHub. So it's almost like a kind of way for people like me who are not huge uh, tech heads and who don't really understand the ins and outs of GitHub in a kind of um, very detailed way. It's almost like a skin for interacting with that in a way that, that makes it easier for, for our team. Yeah, it's super interesting. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, to any generally speaking to any like non-technical person, you mentioned GitHub and it's kind of like, oh my God, like, you know, your eyes sort of glaze over, like, <laughs> don't get, don't get me, don't get me started on like last thing I want to have time for is like learn how to use GitHub, right? Um, great platform, but if, if, if you're not like a tech person, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, that's intimidating. And um, so I, I think like what the, what the beauty of what you've been able to do here is like using, um, you know, we're using this, this sort of, you know, tech savvy platform, you know, the GitHub platform, but you've, you've basically extricated the need for like, you know, anybody who's, who's, who's going to be adding or content managing or anything, they don't have to actually interface with any of that. Right. Cause it's all, you've, you've automated this whole process so that they can, they can basically get around having to use that. And they're, they're, they're interfacing with, you know, basically like no code tools that, uh, any, you know, things like Webflow, which is probably one of the most popular no code website builders you know, on the market right now, probably the most popular. Um, but it is, it is hosted on AWS though. So that was one of the, we, we could just build our website on Webflow, right? But that would all be, that would be hosted on AWS and, you know, pursuant to our, our sort of philosophical conversation earlier, we can't really do that. But you figured out that they are, they're actually really good at, I mean, they would, they would obviously prefer you to build a website on Webflow. Webflow would, uh, but you're able to take, basically export that code in, in, in a very clean manner uh, just because they have a, a nice functionality for exporting clean code, plug it into some of these other tools, route it all through GitHub, and then bam. On, and we have we have this beautiful decentralized website via Fleek. Is that, am, I, am I understanding that correctly? Totally. And, and I think the real, it, it's, an, it's a really good example of decentralization again, because like what it means now is the design team has a design tool, which is Webflow. And, you know, the IT team has an IT tool, which is GitHub. And the marketing team has a marketing tool, which is the CMS, right? So rather than having kind of one tool that we're all trying to train up on and all trying to use at the same time, each of the teams now has a tool that's really specific to the job that they need to do. And um, 
all of that is tied to a single source of truth, which is GitHub. And that's really the key thing here. Like one of the one of the big problems that um or, or one of the drawbacks or trade-offs, I would say, of decentralization is sometimes, you know, we're not always working in the same uh, purpose or like pulling in the same direction. Um, and having that kind of single source of truth on GitHub really helps to um, make sure that we're not producing multiple versions of things, getting confused between like, well, I updated this and you updated that and now only one of them is live and what happened to the other one? All of this means that um, basically our marketing team has a kind of skin for interacting with GitHub in a way. They're, they're using GitHub, they're creating pull requests and they're merging branches and using all these these words that scare me and scare other people like me, um, but they don't even know. They just see a button that says save, they see a button that says publish, and they're able to just interact easily with the stack that way. And what I think is really interesting about this, maybe kind of taking, taking a step back here, is that this really does seem like a very underrated uh, Web3 or maybe decentralized web, whatever, I guess whatever sort of jargon we want to use for this uh, use case, right? Where uh, look like web IPFS, even though IPFS doesn't have like a token uh, or it's not a blockchain. Like I do consider IPFS to be very much kind of like within the, I mean, thinking of like web three is more of like a mindset than it is like a, you know, or a decentralized web is like a mindset more than it is like a particular protocol or token or stack or anything like that. Uh, but it, it very much does kind of fit within that, that ethos. And I, and I do think this case, this use case of, of decentralized website hosting is one that could like, with salute, like, I mean, the reason people don't, didn't do it before is that it, like, you, they would encounter the same problems that you encountered and they, you know, their, their, uh, their, their supervisors probably would not be as lenient as maybe our supervisors were as far as like, Hey, let's experiment with this new tech to try to figure out how do you actually use this in, in, in ways that, 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 that makes sense and is easy and is, and is effective. And, um, so I think, you know, basically being able to make this more usable and like user-friendly um, once more people kind of know about this, that, Hey, like there's, there's an actual, like you can have the benefits of the centralization and the resilience, and you don't have to have the same drawbacks of like, Oh man, this is like impossible to actually use or update. Right. That's, that's really sort of the, the benefit. That's really sort of like, if you boil it down to like what we've actually done here. Uh, I mean, would you agree with that? Would you disagree with that? Agree with that? What's your reaction? Totally. I feel like I feel like I've walked into a room full of someone else's Lego and I'm trying to see which pieces stick together. <laughs> but that's that's kind of the thing, right? We have all of these amazing tools being built across the industry by all these amazing people, some of which are on file by network, some of which are not. And I think when these things become really interesting is when you start trying to plug them into each other and see what they do. You know, and that doesn't mean building a, a Rube Goldberg machine. You know, we don't want the kind of the boot to kick the ball to set off the alarm clock to light the match that burns the you know like we don't want all this kind of like chain reaction stuff built in if we can help it but to have something that's that's relatively simple where you know we have a no code platform that will give us code and that code is readable and can interact with other things and we have a cms platform that can interact with that and, and update the content very easily and we have an amazing hosting platform in fleek that can take that and turn it into something that's fast and works quickly and works well um, and is still up if, if AWS goes down or, or if Google Cloud goes down. I think that's something that's, yeah, it's uh, something that I think could definitely be beneficial to other projects as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's super interesting. And um, you know, I'm really, I, I, it's, it's almost like you're, you're you know, you, you probably don't consider yourself like a builder, quote unquote, like we talk about. I mean, you're a, you're a design guy. Like you know, it says, I'm not like an entrepreneur. I'm not like a developer. But in the sense, it's like you almost kind of need this next level of builder, right? You have a lot of people building kind of the blocks, like building the Legos. And you, you, you need somebody to like, sometimes, you, I mean, a lot of these people, they build stuff in their own little silo or in kind of an isolation almost a lot of the times, right? Where it's like, okay, I have this really, really great thing that works well in this one instance or this one per, for this one particular but you need somebody who can kind of come in and like put the Lego blocks together essentially, which is what you've, I think it's a really great analogy, right? Like you, you have all these tools that like work in their own element, but if you can find a way to combine them, you can get, you know, you get that multiplier effect of like, wow, like this is, so now we have a decentralized website and it's actually easy to use, <laughs> right? Like, uh, you exactly. know, it's like, uh, it's like uh, having butter on your toast, you know, it's like best of both worlds. <laughs> So I think uh, um, when you see that that graph where it's like, you know, kind of like bleeding edge, early adopters, late adopters, and then like everyone else, you know, which is I'm sure something in, people in Web3 have, have seen a lot. 
I always feel like I'm kind of that like second phase behind the early adopters, right? I'm not quite the one like rushing in and like playing with the code and trying to make it do impossible things. But uh, this is a great space for someone like me, especially with a design background where, you know, the design process is we have a problem, we have a goal, what are the tools that we have that can help us, you know, build a solution? And then how do we iterate on that in order to improve it and, and get it up and working? It's a really fertile space for someone like me to yeah, come in and try and plug these things together. And occasionally, oh. surprisingly, it works, which is yeah. <laughs> even better. So how long did it take you to figure this out? Just out of curiosity. Uh, do I want, um, do I, do I want to know the answer to that question? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, uh, I remember bashing my head a lot during Christmas <laughs> like last year, trying to, to get these things to work. I mean, this was a, a really huge um, need for us, right? I'm, I'm so used to from, from my background before the foundation working design agencies and things, I'm used to working on websites and I'm used to like having these things up, but the, a website is essentially like a huge document, right? That can that can adjust to any size of screen. So for a designer, it, it makes total sense that a graphic designer is someone who would be building those things because we have the school, the tools in terms of layout, typography, you know, color, texture, all of these things that we need to build a document that's like engaging and interactive. Um, yeah, so I I'm always interested to try and like see what I can do without having to learn to code and see what I can plug into to what. So it took a while. It took a few weeks. There are some things now that I, I look back at the documentation I put together and I'm like, how did I figure that out? Like, I have no idea <laughs> like, where that, that one in piece of like, you know, that one action command came from that tells me like how to build the site correctly. But, you know, we have a really active space and we have people who are really interested to share the things that they learn. So just being able to search and, and, and learn from others has been hugely helpful. Yeah. yeah. And maybe just to kind of wrap things up here, like what advice would you have for somebody who maybe they're listening to this and they're like, wow, that sounds really interesting. I'd like to figure out how to do that myself. Um, I mean, you kind of blazed the trail and did all the hard, hard work essentially. Um, but you know, how, like realistically, like how, if I'm, if I'm, you know, if I'm a, in your, your, your role at like, xyz company and I'm like hey i really want to try that uh how much work am i realistically how long will it realistically take me to like implement what you've what you figured out here uh not very long one of the things that i really love about working at the foundation is we share our work you know that we're working not just for the benefit of the filepoint network which is our, our main goal but for the benefit of the whole industry for the benefit of humanity so uh everything we do we like to to share um, so we have a, a few resources available. People can go to our blog on phil.org and read a bit about this project. There's a downloadable case study that's linked in that blog, a PDF that you can go through that explains the tech stack. Uh, it's also documented on GitHub and our GitHub repos are open. There's links from the documentation there to all of the tools that we've used. So the answer is now, I mean, like an hour, I would say. <laughs> like, no, oh, if wow. you have a website <laughs> and you want to get it on fleet, you could probably do that in, in 20, 30 minutes if you follow our instructions. And it should all be replicable. All of the tools except for Udisly are open source tools as well. Um, Udisly is an open source, but it is a fantastic tool. The team who built that have been incredibly helpful as well, helping us figure out how to get this up and running. Um, so yeah, there's now a lot of resources available. And of course, if anyone really needs help and, and they're struggling, they can always reach out to us at design at and we'll be able to, to guide them through the process. And just out of curiosity, because I know you were interacting with some of the the support teams from some from Udisly and some of the other sites, and I mean, what was their reaction when you were like explaining to them how they're you're trying to hack their you know their 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 platform essentially? Like, were you're like, were they just like you're trying to do what? Uh, what, think, was, what was their response? I think the key response for most people was like, we're not going to be responsible for that. Like, that's <laughs> your problem. We'll we'll help you with this bit that that covers what we do, and then you can deal with all of that. <laughs> um, but, you know, all of the teams are really helpful. The tools are really amazing. Fleek is an incredible tool. Webflow is an incredible tool. Udisly is an incredible tool. So, and Netlify CMS as well, or now Decap CMS. They, they, it's just, uh, they're all made so easily, easy to use. They all have such great documentation. It was just a matter of, like I say, plugging in the Lego pieces together. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great example of, of just kind of entrepreneurial, you know, or maybe intrapreneurial, whatever you want to, you know, however you want to, we, we want to frame this, but it's a really good example of, of just kind of finding 
a lot of times, like I think of like entrepreneurship and innovation is really, it's like, yeah, there's gonna be some people that like to build this like brand new thing from scratch. That's like world changing. But a lot of times innovation really comes, you know, it's, it's like, you're just kind of taking something that's like 95% fine and making it like 5% better. Right. Or like finding, finding ways to, to combine a couple of things that already exist in their own element. And you combine these things in a way that creates a lot of additional value. And it's just, sometimes it just takes someone who can kind of understand the problem well enough, understand uh, the, the existing solutions well enough and just figure out how to make this thing incrementally better using tools that already exist. And bam, you've got, you've got a new product that is adding a lot of value uh, far beyond, you know, maybe like the, the, the sum is greater than the, the parts basically. Um, so I think that's it's a good example of what you've done here. I think it shows as well, like why we need, you know, more people in our industry and, and a more diverse set of skills in our industry, because, you know, we have amazing engineers who are doing amazing work, but if you show any engineer a problem, their solution is, you know, build a bridge. Like we're going to build a thing that fixes the problem. And, you know, coming to this industry as a designer, we have a very different skill set. You know, we do create a lot of things, but design is almost like music, you know, in so much that like, it's a thing that humans have been doing for a few thousand years and pretty much everything you've thought of is a problem that has already been solved by someone else at some point. Yeah. You know, so you can go back and look at like, you know, um, tube maps are a great example. There's a reason that every tube map in every city in the world looks the same. It's because it's a really functional solution to the problem. So I think having more designers in Web3 where we can, you know, look at all the people building bridges and be like, you know, if we just kind of put this thing in the middle that connects all of them, then all of this is going to work really well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's, it's really having that kind of end user experience in mind and, and really making this... Um, I mean, I think everyone's in agreement. This isn't a controversial statement, but you know, none of this stuff is really going to become mainstream until we really start thinking of these things with the end end user in mind. And, and how, how do you, you know, not every designer is going to be like a hardcore coder who understands how to, how to do all these things. So like, how do you make this just, how do you make that onboarding? And you, at the end of the day, you have to create an experience that's like just as good or not, if not better than what currently exists to get any kind of meaningful adoption. Right. Um, you know, I mean, arguably it have to be like, and significantly better to get that to get to give significant adoption. I think in this case, I think you can get by with, you know, having something that's basically equal plus the decentralization bit, the, the IPFS bit, right. That, okay, maybe we have an equal in terms of experience, it's an equal product, but you get the decentralized bit that gives it these extra benefits. So it's like, okay, that, that in, when I'm doing my calculus in my mind, like, okay, that makes it worth it to do this. But if I'm going to be, if I'm getting if the benefit I'm getting is the decentralization, but also creates like five times the work to like update anything. It's like, well, you know, practically speaking, that's not like making my life any easier in any reasonable way. That's just creating more problems for me in the short run. So I I'm think, much less likely to adopt that solution. Yeah. There's a, a lot of instances where people are like, I want this thing from web two, but I want it in web three. And they just want to take it and move it and keep it exact as it is. And that doesn't really play to the strengths right now for us. We have a solution by, by embracing decentralization as a, not just the kind of nice buzzword to put on a poster on a wall, but as something that we actually try to practice in our work, we've created a solution that, that makes everyone's life easier. You know, now people don't have to, uh, people in the West Coast don't have to wait for me to wake up to make an update to their site. And, you know, I don't have to try to go through like five different teams, uh, pieces of content and, and get them all up at the same time. You know, now everyone can have the keys to their own kind of kingdom and we can, we can distribute that power more evenly, which I think is, uh, yeah, something that we try to practice a lot as an industry, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, very cool, Gary. This is this is super cool. Uh, congratulations on on figuring this out. I feel like very, you know, honored to have have, have at least played some minor part in this journey with you. But uh, very <laughs> impressive, very cool. Um, I think it, it's just a great example of of like how like web three is like, it's, it's a mindset, right? You're like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure out how to hack this. Uh, I'm going to figure out how to make this. Like we need to figure out how to make this like as good, if not better than what currently exists. And, um, you know, I think you've, you know, everybody has a role to play essentially, right? Like you're, you're not gonna be the guy that builds the next blockchain that scales to the moon or whatever, but like, you're the guy that's like figuring out how do we actually take these, these principles of centralization centralized website hosting as, as your kind of swim lane. You're like, how do we make this like easily accessible for everyday people? And you've created a very cool solution using no code tools that like basically anybody and their grandmother could use and, and download that are, you know, uh, very, you know, 
there's the barriers to entry to these things are very minimal if, 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 if any, and, uh, you've, you've created a way that basically anybody can use this sort of thing, which is super cool. So congratulations. And, um, Thank you. I'll turn it over to you for any final thoughts before we uh, wrap it up here. Um, thanks very much. Yeah. It's always, it's always nice to have your work kind of celebrated and especially in an industry like this, where so many things are being done for the first time, even if it's just taking these two things and putting them together. Um, and a lot of the time that doesn't always work. So it's really nice to have something cool that we can share that we can like give to the broader community and industry is like, Hey, here's a way that you can now host your sites on web three. And, and exactly as you said, maybe on the surface, it kind of looks the same, right. But under the, you know, beneath the tip of the iceberg, we now have really, really solid foundations that, that mean that we have resilience. We have all of these amazing benefits that we hadn't thought about. And, you know, this is really just the beginning, like, the more we play with this, the more things we try to, to put together, the, the more exciting the results are going to be. Amazing. Um, well, Gary, thanks so much. And thanks to everyone for, for listening to us on the DWeb Decoded podcast. We'll be back again with another great episode.